James, great to speak to you and all the more so when we're here to talk about your first year in the position of music director of the Verbier Festival Junior Orchestra, a role which of course you have alongside your existing roles of chief conductor of the Lucerne Symphony Orchestra and principal guest conductor of the Netherlands Radio Philharmonic. Now I know you're very excited about this year so perhaps you could tell us what is it about the VFGO that makes it such an exciting proposition for you and, and indeed actually for any guest conductor coming to direct them? Well, I think it's a great question. First of all, education has always been a part of my life. It was such an important role for me uh, to become what I've become. Um, if it wasn't for the public school education in New York City, I wouldn't have had the opportunities um, to learn an instrument and to play in a band and an orchestra and have lessons even. Um, so education has always been important to me, kind of balancing my professional life with, with giving back to these young musicians. And I think what's so impressive about the junior orchestra is the actual age, um, this age uh, in between, let's say, 14 or 15 and 19. Um, these young musicians are extraordinary musicians, uh, technically and musically already. Um, but they're also, it, it, it's like a blank slate. They're, they're completely open to new ideas and new ways of doing things. And I feel uh, privileged to be a part uh, in this very crucial time and this crucial window of a musician's life. And you have actually been a part right from the word go as well, haven't you? You were there for y their first yeah. year in 2013. Yeah, in that first year, I believe it was called something different. It was a it was a kind of prototype, and and Daniel Harding was involved, and he's a very good friend and colleague of mine. And um, it seemed like the whole festival, the the whole Verbier Festival, embraced this idea, and they believed in this idea of this very young youth orchestra made up of many different types of people um, from all over the world, and I. I fell in love with it right from the beginning. Um, I was shocked by the level, um, even more so the last time I came um, a couple of summers ago. But right from the beginning, I felt that it was an intimate setting. It was a safe setting for these young musicians. It was a place where they could make mistakes and they can get advice from some of the greatest orchestra players working today. So. I find it very intimate, I find it um, a very high level, um, but most importantly it's safe for these young musicians. And who are these young musicians? Where, where are they coming from? They come from all over. I mean, the, the last summer that I was there with the orchestra, um, I, I, we, we counted the different nationalities and it was extraordinary. I mean, there were, there were young kids from Russia, from all over Asia. Um, there were a couple from the U.S., there were German, Austrian, um, I believe Italian, Spanish. It was, it was pretty impressive. And, you know, I hate to sound cliche, but music is an international language. And, and although some of um, these young musicians uh, were probably intimidated by the amount of English and French they were hearing, um, you, you get to communicate somehow through music. And I, and I think they felt they felt good in that in that respect. Hmm. I, I'll always remember the first time I heard them. I was actually interviewing Martin Engstrom at the time and we were backstage at the Salle de Combat and it was so hard to concentrate on interviewing Martin because uh -huh. the sound that was coming off from the right, I was sitting there going, what, that's, that's the junior orchestra? No, so it's shocking. You... It's really, you know, I, the is. last time I was there, we were rehearsing... Schumann Symphony Number no. One and Brahms Academic Festival Overture, and it really sounded like a, a professional orchestra at a high level, and I, I was so moved by that. I mean, of course, many of them are doing it for the first time, and that's that's the shocking thing about it. No, it is. It's absolutely crazy. And you say that you've seen a development from twenty thirteen through to twenty nineteen, without a doubt. And I, I think, mm. I think that 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 goes hand in hand with the audition process and the fact that these young musicians, they're out there, we just need to find them. And I would say the team involved in the audition process is extraordinary. And, and the people traveling around going to hear these young musicians, um, um, it, it, it's 
time consuming, but it's extremely important because otherwise they're, they won't be heard. Now you've got some big romantic repertoire this year. You've got Brahms two, Rachmaninoff, Paganini variations, um, Tchaikovsky, Romeo and Juliet, um, Prokofiev, Romeo and Juliet. Um, and of course, La Boheme, which we'll talk about separately in a little bit. How, how do you go about choosing the repertoire for this very particular bunch of young musicians? Well, I think it's important to, to choose pieces of music that serve as, let's say, um, um, the baseline or the foundation of orchestral playing. Um, and I think in a romantic sense, uh, Tchaikovsky, Romeo and Juliet um, offers these young musicians all of the tools they would need to play other Russian repertoire um, uh, into the future. I, I believe a piece like Romeo and Juliet they can relate to because of of course Romeo and Juliet were the ages of these young musicians playing the repertoire. Um, the story is something they can relate to, whether they've had heartache or not, or if they've fallen in love or not, they will be soon, <laughs> most likely. Um, but I also think the level, uh, uh, let's say the difficulty of these pieces, it's very challenging, but doable. And I think that's extremely important, um, that they can have a good time without stressing that the concert's coming. Um, and they can, but they can actually have something to look forward to in the concert to celebrate what they've learned. Brahms, of course, I mean, the second symphony of Brahms, if they can play the first movement of the second symphony, this could translate into many other composers like Schumann and other music of Brahms and Strauss and things like that. So I think it, it serves for a good, um, foundation of sound, of color, of orchestral timbre, um, that they can apply to other things in their lives. Um, I think also working with soloists, the flexibility uh, that that takes, you know, working with people like Bektsad Abdurraimov and Joshua Bell, they get to see the give and take that a soloist has with an orchestra. And you can't really teach that at school. It's something they need to experience. And um, this is a perfect place and an environment for them to do so. Now, you touch on so many things there, um, colours, etc. Um, how exactly do you go about training an orchestra to perform that repertoire? You've, you've said what you want them to get out of it, but how do you make sure they get that? Well, I think they need to come prepared uh, to a certain degree. That's without a doubt. And I think they're going to experience that what they've prepared in a practice room doesn't always work with 50 other individuals in a room. And that's what we work on in that room. Of course, they need to prepare the repertoire. Technically, they need to be able to play it before that first rehearsal. Um, it's then how to play with their colleagues, intonation, the way they use the bow, the bow speed, what it means to be in the back of a section instead of being in the front of the section, how you produce sound. Um, for the wind players, uh, breathing together uh, and breathing with string players. That's something that you don't necessarily think of as a wind player because you've got your own things on your mind, your, your reeds or um, the technical difficulty of a solo passage coming up. But then once that preparation happens at home, when they get into a room, it's the idea of how to react to others. And that's something I can help with. Um, when you're playing a very difficult virtuosic solo as a wind player, for example, but how to do that and be aware of your colleagues in the string section who are supporting you uh, with their sound and their color and or rhythmic impetus, for example. So I think bringing all these things to attention to a young musician is extremely important. And there's a lot to cover, of course, in three weeks. Um, but I think we set a realistic standard of what what's possible uh, and, yeah. and how to do it. And of course, it's not just you helping them to right. cover this, is it? You've also got a team of coaches around you. It, Can you tell us who your coaches yeah. are this year and what they do and, and why have you picked the people that you've picked? Right. This is the beauty of, of this um, junior orchestra. And, and one of the reasons I have accepted this position is that we have a team of people uh, working together um, 
and constantly moving throughout the orchestra. And that is so important because sometimes you don't want to bring things to the intention of the entire room. Um, some people are shy and they get embarrassed. So the coach can go and whisper something into their ear or say, hey, you're doing a great job. Get, make a little more sound here or maybe pull out, pull out a little bit because it's, uh, it's, it's sharp. Um, you know, all these little things can go, can be addressed in a personal way. So these coaches, they are all wonderful with young musicians and we're, we're very careful in choosing these types of people. And we're not ready yet to announce an official list of, of the coaches because we're still working on, on some of, uh, their availability and, and, and how, uh, some logistical things. But um, overall, we're we're yeah eighty five percent there, and we're um, really pleased with who's coming this summer. And where do the I know you can't give us names, but what kind of profile does that person have? Well, some of them are have major positions in in big orchestras around the world. For example, Orchestra de Paris um, or London Symphony, uh, and some of them have incredible teaching positions. Um, so I think we have a good combination of people who who play professionally at the highest level and who teach at the highest level, and some do both. So I think it's important that these people are not just famous or have high profile positions, but that they understand what it's like to work with this particular age group, which is very different than working with let's say, uh, conservatory grad students or people who are, are getting their master's degree, or it's different than teaching a child, you know. So I think um, it, it's a special type of person we want. We also want someone who understands what it means to work with a team and to have, to have a kind of joint vision about the institution. Um, uh, it's important to me that these people are passionate and and patient with these young musicians. And these young musicians, presumably, um, one of the joys I would imagine is that you have these sort of symphonic war horses, but they're not yet war horses for these young musicians. That must be incredible yeah. as a conductor. Well, it gives me gives me chills to think about. I remember, <laughs> if I think back to my life playing in orchestra, youth orchestras, I remember the first time I did every piece of music. So. If I'm conducting something for the first time, I'll always have a flashback at some point to the first time I heard this piece of music from within an orchestra and my first experience with those pieces. Um, so I feel privileged, like I said before, uh, of being part of this first for these young musicians, um, these first experiences. Um, so, I mean, it is a blank slate, but they're already bringing something to it in the sense of where they're from, where the, what their teachers have taught them in the past, what they've learned from their colleagues, and then they take it to the next level. And um, so, yeah, we, we consider these pieces war horses, but I could guarantee you most of them haven't played them before. Yeah. Now, the one piece that I think everybody in that orchestra will not have played this year is, of course, Puccini's La Boheme. Mm. Um, partnership between the Atelier Lyrique part of yeah. the Academy. Um, and, and it's very much to showcase and develop both the orchestral musicians and the singers. Now, we'll talk about the singers separately in a minute, but for a teenage orchestra to be playing a full-scale opera. And this is this is incredible. Mm. Um, why do you want them to have that experience this early in their musical careers? And and what does Bohem specifically give them? Why did you choose Bohem? Oh, there's so much I have to say about this, but let's, let's <laughs> try to keep it short. Go. <laughs> La Bohem, in my opinion, is the perfect opera. It's the perfect opera to introduce to someone who hasn't been to the opera. It's a perfect opera for any musician who is a serious musician. Um, the play between text, drama, and music is at the highest level imaginable. Um, if you can play Bohème, if you can play La Bohème, you can do anything. And I seriously mean that. Um, the flexibility one needs to play La Bohème, the understanding of the rubati, and the, the give and take of, uh, of the flow of the music 
and how to listen to a singer and breathe with a singer and know if the singer is going to move forward or hold back. It's not just the job of a conductor, it's the job of a great orchestra. And I think if these young musicians take this seriously, which I think they will, and they'll have the music in advance um, and they'll know which parts they're going to be playing. I think they'll, they'll, this will be one of the most memorable experiences for them. And, and they'll be able to, like I said before, apply these tools into different genres of opera if they become professional musicians. Um, so if you learn Bohème, I think you can apply some things to Wagner and some things to Strauss. And if you're playing a Verdi opera in the future, um, I think the truth is everything will seem a little bit easier after having done Bohème. So um, not only is it a great tool for learning, it's, it's really one of the best pieces ever written. Um, it's orchestrally brilliant, it's complex, levels and transparency um, that are extraordinary for these young musicians to learn at such a young age. Um, yeah, I think it'll be a great experience, and and I I was hesitant at first when they when they said they wanted to do Bohème because it it is truly one of the hardest operas uh, to play as an orchestra musician. Um, but then I thought, why not? I mean, now is 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 the best time for these young musicians. And then for the singers as well, it's been chosen to highlight them and train them. What does it give a singer, a young singer? Yeah, I mean, once you have a role from Bohème under your belt, um, it's a calling card for many opera houses around the world. Um, whether it's a smaller role like Chouinard or, or Colline, um, this is something they have with them that they can always bring back into their muscle memory, and they'll continue to develop, of course, with it. And then the roles, you'll find that sometimes the people who are singing Musetta later on sing Mimi, um, and you find that the people who have sung Chonard are singing Marcello now. So, you know, Bohème stays with singers throughout their lives. Um, sometimes the roles change, or sometimes the voice changes uh, dramatically so. And then, of course, they don't, uh, touch that particular role anymore, but it stays with them. The language of Puccini, this kind of, um, it all comes from earlier on, bel canto and things like that, and then it develops into this other language of Puccini. Um, and I think it's, it's, a, it's, it's an extraordinary place for these young singers to have that first experience. And like I said about the junior orchestra, I believe Verbier is a safe place. It's a place where people can make mistakes. They can try things out for the first time. Um, yet it's on an extremely high level. So I'm, I'm really excited about this collaboration. Uh, and I don't think the young musicians of the Junior Orchestra even really know how great it's going to be for them. <laughs> they will find out soon. Yeah. Now, you have one further teaching role this year. Um, a new position has been created for a uh, Max Haberstock, very exciting young talent, a conducting talent, and he's going to be your sort of conductor in residence at the orchestra this year, isn't he? Tell us yes, more about is. how that has come about and and what he will be learning from you. Right. Well, um, the truth is, a bunch of conductors came um, on a particular day to work with the orchestra. Some of them gave concerts of um, an, individual, an individual movement or piece of music on, on a concert with the junior orchestra. And I didn't necessarily agree with the idea of young conductors coming and working with the junior orchestra because I don't think it was so fair to the junior orchestra, if you get what I'm saying. It wasn't like mm -hmm. a professional orchestra giving podium time to a young conductor because the young conductor could therefore learn from them. Um, I thought it was a little bit it wasn't planned very well. And then when I was having this kind of, these thoughts in my head, a young man named Max got up on the podium. They said, well, he's not going to be performing, but we want, we want to give him an opportunity to conduct the orchestra. And I was immediately, yeah, shocked, shocked is the word. And I won't edit that. I was shocked at this young man's understanding of the score 
and understanding of what it means to be leading an orchestra. I thought physically he already had many gifts of how to control an orchestra, how to breathe with an orchestra. I think he already knew how to study a score and how to internalize the music of a score. But there were other things missing um, that I think I can help with. And that has to do with the psychology of an orchestra. It has to do with how you speak with an orchestra and how you get them to do what you want without asking them to do what you want with words. Um, mm. So I believe that Max is a talent and I think it would be a shame for us not to give him this opportunity. Um, so I'm very excited by that. We're going to give him one piece to work on throughout the summer and perform at some point. And also he'll be working with me on Bohem and some other pieces of music uh, in kind of private study and things like that. But I, I'll say it again. I mean, the, this, he's so talented. He has many of the tools he needs already. Um, but he just has to do it in a safe place and in a safe environment. I know I keep mentioning this word safe, but no, it's but because it's true, then. it's true. Many young musicians are a flash in the pan because they do well. Someone discovers them. They go around doing things, conducting orchestras or they're soloists with orchestra A, B and C around the world. And then they disappear. They're a flash in the pan. And I, I think we owe it to these young musicians these talented young musicians to create a safe environment in which they could blossom and then go celebrate um, because many of them don't have that opportunity. So yeah, I'm excited for this and I hope it's the beginning of, of many uh, young conductors that come through the junior orchestra. I also think the, the way you work with this particular age group of an orchestra is different than the way you work with the Bavarian Radio Symphony Orchestra or the Cleveland Orchestra. And I think um, there's something to that. And, and that's important for these young conductors to also realise. Hmm. Wonderful. Final question. Uh, it's been a bad year for young musicians. It's been a bad year for everybody, but a bad year for young musicians and particularly, I suspect, teenagers. What do you want the 2021 Verbier Junior Orchestra to, to get out of this year? And indeed, the people watching them on stage. I think the Verbier Festival Junior Orchestra should be a beacon of light in this very dark time. I think whether people are watching on the internet or social media, or they're in the audience to experience these concerts, or they come to a visit, they visit a rehearsal. Um, I believe the junior orchestra should be the definition of what young musicians should be doing today. Um, of course, there are many different variations of this, this that have happened before. People talk about El Sistema that started in Venezuela and now has moved to other parts of the world. Beautiful concept of giving young people opportunities to express themselves in a safe environment. Um, I think the junior orchestra it should be, it, it's like a microcosm of what we should be doing everywhere. Um, developing young talent in, in this safe environment with positive reinforcement, um, never negativity. Uh, I think this should be happening everywhere with young people, not just in the music world, um, but everywhere. And, and also, I think into the future, we have to keep in mind that we don't discriminate uh, towards anyone, any gender, race, any identity. I think we should give everyone opportunities. And I think now in today's world, with all this negativity, and even sometimes when people like to shine light on what's missing from the world. They say, oh, there's not this type of person working in this field. And then they try to find all those people very quickly. That's putting a Band-Aid on the problem. I think we should be starting them from a very young age. Uh, and that's exactly what we're doing with the Junior Orchestra uh, at Verbier Festival. James Gaffigan, thank you very much indeed. Thank you very much.